always use for reminder. Yeah. Okay. okay. So I guess we started. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back to Brands at Bay. And we had uh, Yadas this time. So last one was in November. Uh, today, we have a very special guest, which is Jeff. But before, I wanted to talk a little bit about Brands at Bay. So Brands at Bay is an online uh, machine learning meets neuroscience meetup. Uh, we started in, in the Bay Area, hence the name. Uh, we currently have about a thousand members. It was just uh, last week with Madison. So uh, thanks everyone. And the idea is to discuss the brain's part machine learning algorithms and from the perspective of both neuroscientists and machine learning researchers. So we had previous meetups on alternative to back propagation. There's all type of there. Active dendrites, lateral connections, predictive processing, having learning and a lot of other topics. So if you have uh, feedback or suggestions for next topics, just uh, leave a message in the meetup board or just send me an email. And that's all I have of slides today. And today I'll be uh, co-hosting with Charmaine. You can probably see her in the screen as well. Hello. And so the way we're gonna do this, we have, we booked two hours. Uh, so we're going to try and answer all the questions within uh, an hour and a half, but if we can, we, we book for two hours, so we might extend a little bit. And um, the way we're going to do this, I have some questions to Jeff, so we're going to have like a small conversation about thousand brains theory, how it applies to machine learning. And my goal here is to help machine learning practitioners of, in understanding how to apply this theory to uh, actual uh, machine learning algorithms. How can we use these ideas to, to improve the existing algorithms? So we're gonna talk a little bit about neuroscience, a little bit about machine learning. We're not gonna cover in the main conversation, we're not gonna cover other topics of the book. So it's mainly gonna be about the theory, but we will open to questions in the second part where we can talk about anything. So um, just don't be afraid to ask questions related uh, to the book in general. So uh, Jeff, can I, Go ahead and start. Yeah, sure, sure. You know, it's it, uh, as Lucas and I were talking a little while ago. It's, uh, he wants to focus uh, here on the machine learning aspects of this. Of course, I'm more of a neuroscientist point of view. So occasionally, I may be pointing putting those questions back on Lucas and others to help me out. But we'll see how it goes. Okay, and uh, yeah, as a disclaimer, uh, I work for. So I've introduced Jeff. For, I think Jeff doesn't need an introduction, but. Anyway, uh, Jeff Hawkins is a serial entrepreneur. He founded several companies, including Palm, Handspring, uh, Redwood Neuroscience Institute, and then Menta. And besides being an entrepreneur, he's first and foremost a neuroscience and an AI researcher. Uh, Jeff has two books. So On Intelligence was the first book, one that uh, was very inspiring for me and the reason I came to work at the Menta in the first place. So. I uh, just want to leave that disclaimer that I also work at Nementa with Jeff. And he just released a second book, A Thousand, a Thousand Brains, which is the book we are going to uh, focus on. So Jeff, uh, I wanted to ask you, started asking you a question about your motivation. So why did you write this book? Uh, well, this I put, I put up front that, you know, writing a book is a lot of work. <laughs> it takes a long time to work on this. I know, full time, almost like a year. Um, so it's it's not uh, it's not something I you know I want to be an author or sell books. Um, but in the last five years at Nementa, we had made some pretty I think really important discoveries about brain and the nature of um, intelligence in general, but specifically mechanisms how the neocortex works. And we had published most of that work in um, scientific papers. But you know, honestly, those scientific papers are very difficult to read. They don't tie together too well because you write them one at a time, different times. And so I, I felt the story was very important and I wanted to make it um, in, a, in a more accessible format um, because I think uh, they're important, they're important ideas. So um, that's why I wrote the book. Um, I felt it's like, hey, this is part of what we do is, is to communicate what we do. What's the point of doing something if you can't communicate it? And um, so I said, well, a book would be a good format to do that. Right, and uh, it was. <laughs> I think it's a good way of communicating those to the general public. So one of the most important aspects in the book and the whole the theory in general is the idea of a cortical column. 
So can you explain what a colorful column is and where the idea first originated? Yeah, so um, we're talking neuroscience now. So if you uh, look at the human brain, you've got this neocortex, which is you know the big wrinkly thing that covers the rest of the brain. And it's a, sh it's a sheet of neural tissue. It's about two and a half millimeters thick. And it's, you know, 1500 square centimeters. Um, it is discussed as it's divided into these columns. Now, if you were to look at an, under the neocortex under a microscope, you don't see these columns. We're talking about the larger columns now, not the micro columns, but I'll leave that aside. Um, so these, uh, and we talked about these columns about somewhere between a half millimeter and a millimeter, or maybe a little bit more in size and area, but they're not visible under the microscope. But they exist because they've been shown um, in some sense uh, empirically to exist in that if you were to stick a probe through the neocortex and vertically down through the two and a half millimeters, uh, let's say this part of the cortex is getting input from the eye or maybe it's getting input from the skin. All the cells that would respond in that vertical uh, path uh, would coming from the same small patch of the retina or the same small patch of the skin but if you stick the probe horizontally through the neocortex, um, what you'd see is for about, about a millimeter, all the cells would respond to the same patch of the sensory area, the retina or the skin, and then they would abruptly change to an adjacent patch of the retina uh, or the skin and abruptly change again in another one. So the cells, uh, even though you can't see a cortical column, they, um, the tissue in, the, in about a, a column, a millimeter square column of cortex all responds to the same source of input and the next area over responds to a different source of input. And that's where the idea comes from. Um, I'm not sure the first person to propose it, but it was certainly um, uh, highly promoted by uh, Vernon Mountcastle, who I wrote about in the book, um, who was a neurophysiologist at Johns Hopkins. And he published just going back in the 70s, um, really arguing for the existence of cortical columns as uh, not just a, a, um, a, a unit of uh, uh, pro it's a unit of processing in the cortex, but also that it is a, a fundamental element of, of processing in, in the neocortex. Great, and uh, you talk a lot about uh, Werner Mountcastle in the book and your interactions with him. Uh, that really, for me, that was a very interesting part, you know, to, it was like I was there with you and, and watching this happening and talking to Mountcastle and even about the last words you exchanged with him. I think that was a, a nice touch. So some of the ideas discussed in this book, they were first introduced in your first book on intelligence in 2004, such as the cortical column, we just talk about the, the role of movement intelligence and the brain being the predictive engine that builds a model of the world. So what still holds from the first book? Uh, what has been superseded or deprecated and why? And what are the new elements that are introduced in the thousand brains on top of that? Well, I think in general, uh, almost uh, most of what's in the first book, I would still adhere to. Um, I haven't read it recently. I, in fact, I decided not to read on intelligence before I read, um, before I wrote A Thousand Brains, because I was afraid that if I read it again right before I wrote the new book, I would subconsciously pick up the exact same words and language that I used before. And so I didn't want to do that. Um, so I haven't read it in a while. The last time I read it, it might have been like five years ago or something like that. And I was, I was pleasantly surprised at how much of the book I would stick, that I still adhere to. Um, I'm sure now if I looked at it, I'd find some things that I, you know, oh, you know uh, oh, that was wrong. But I, I think in general, I, I don't think there's anything fundamentally that I would disagree with in the first book. Um, but the new book goes well beyond that. You know, we talked about this sort of predictive model um, in the brain, in the neocortex, in on intelligence. That's been sort of a guiding factor for ourselves and other people too, like right? how does brain build this model of the world? And, uh, but we didn't really know the details, any real details about it in uh, when I wrote a thousand brains, I mean, excuse me, when I wrote um, on intelligence. Um, we didn't understand um, several major things which we now do understand, we understand better, um, which form the heart of the new book. And, one of those is exactly how information is, is processed in cortical columns. And this is the idea of reference frames that the, the cortex actually implements all these, every column implements all these reference frames of which uh, the sensory input is associated with locations in reference frames relative to external um, things in the world. 
And we didn't know about that, the idea of reference frames uh, in the cortex. That was a very foreign, no one had ever discussed that at all back in the times of intelligence. Uh, and from that, that now gave us a, a much better understanding how the brain learns using these reference frames. And then we understood that each cortical column was a complete sensory motor system, sensory motor modeling system. We did not know that um, when I wrote on intelligence. We, we assumed that the model was incorporated in the hierarchy of cortical regions like everyone else did. Um, and there is still this hierarchy of cortical regions, but we now know that every cortical column is a complete modeling system on its own, uh, which was a totally surprising idea. We didn't expect that. And then um, along with that, we also now understand how columns are voting, um, which we didn't understand before either. And that gives a whole nother way of filter looking about how the connections of the brain, what they do. So it's kind of like we had the big idea of on intelligence, but we didn't really know how it worked at all in terms of like sensory motor integration and how knowledge is stored in reference frames and how the cortex is organized overall. We got that kind of wrong. Uh, I guess that is something we got wrong in on intelligence. Um, uh, so those are the big ideas and they're really big ideas. I don't want to, you know, the downplay, them. I think they're, they're really important ideas. It's, it, it sort of explains how knowledge is stored in a system like a brain, what it means to know something uh, in integrating the sensory and the motor interactions with these reference frames. Uh, so um, that was a big piece. And then of course, in the book, I go beyond the biological theory. I spend much more time uh, on the new book uh, talking about artificial intelligence and uh, the prospects and issues associated with that. And the third part of the book, I talk about other things related to humanity. Um, but the primary genesis of the book was that we had made these major discoveries in the last five years and we wanted to uh, convey them. You mentioned there is a shift in how you understand hierarchy and that now each particle column is an individual unit capable of uh, processing and understanding the word by itself. So can you elaborate a bit on that? What has changed? In a yeah, I hierarchy? mean, our, our thinking of hierarchy in the past was, um, was much more uh, mainstream in the sense that, um, oh yeah, it's, you know, it's like how deep the deep learning networks work today, right? You know, you have those inputs come in, you extract some some small features and you combine them into other features and you combine them with other features and so on. And you end up with some representation uh, higher up in the hierarchy. Um, that's the way deep learning networks work today. And that's the way we thought and everyone else in neuroscience thought the neocortex works. And, and so that was a nice, what we added, what I added in um, on intelligence, we were saying, we were talking about time-based patterns. So we would say, hey, you know, there's this, there's this idea that you have these changing patterns coming into the brain and they have to get turned into stable patterns because you know we don't, we're not aware of our eye movements and we're not you know, all the time, things like that. And so uh, we figured it's this sort of, we added this idea of, of time-based temporal memory. So we, we use the term HTM, hierarchical temporal memory. So that was something we were focusing on that other people weren't focusing on at that time. Um, but now with this idea that every cortical column is its own modeling system, uh, that just, throws a lot of the ideas about hierarchy out the window. Um, not completely, but there's some of them. And I, I have to be honest, I think I understand hierarchy much less than I thought I understood it before. But because now we have a whole series of questions that come about like, well, if every column in the cortex is learning complete models of the world, what are they passing between each other? And so we're spending a lot of time right now talking about hierarchical composition um, and how do you do a nested structure um, you know, how much of that's occurring in, a quarter, occurring in the cortical column, how much is it occurring between regions and cortex and so on. So in some sense, I feel uh, more confused about hierarchy now than I did um, 10 years ago, <laughs> but I was wrong 10 years ago. And I think most, I, I think at least from the brain's point of view, I think uh, we all had it wrong um, uh, that no one, I don't think anticipated this idea that uh, columns are complete modeling systems because I'm not aware of anyone saying that. So I wish I had better answers to you, Lucas, on exactly how, but you know, we, I talk about it a bit in the book um, and I make some speculations about, you know, how to think about hierarchy now. Uh, good science is about asking, it's more about asking the right questions than having the right answers. Right? Yeah, and, and, and also accepting the fact when you, when you got something wrong, just embrace it and, and kind of love it, you know, <laughs> so. All right. So one of the things that theory addresses is how to solve the binding problem. I thought that was a very interesting piece of the book. Can you uh, talk a little bit about that? How does it solve the binding problem? Um, okay, so you know the binding problem, you, you, people you hear it a lot, um, and and I, we have to be 
careful, and maybe I should try to define it because I think not everyone uses it the same way. Um, so I'll, just, I'll talk about some aspects of what the problem is. Um, it can, you can look at it different ways. Um, one way, a simple way of looking at the binding problem is to say, well, we have all these different sensory inputs and they're being processed in different parts of the neocortex. Um, how do they get combined into a single sensory perception? So how do these different um, components of color and texture and sounds and so on get mind a single sensory perception? And the thinking, the thinking was, well, in the brain, we ought to see uh, this convergence of all these inputs into some spot where, you know, perception occurs. Um, but the brain doesn't really look like that. And so that was one of the problems. We don't really see this, you know, the, it's sort of the inputs of the brain sort of go all over at once. They don't seem to come, come together and bind into some spot. Another more detailed way of thinking about the binding problem, which I found much more fascinating and, and tricky to understand, if you take something like vision, and okay, so the back of your retina, you have this nice image projected on the back of your retina, but um, the distribution of the uh, sensory receptors, the photoreceptors on the retina is very, uh, it's highly irregular. Um, it's very distorted. There's holes and blood vessels and, and you know, optic nerve holes coming through the blind spot. And so what's actually projected to the cortex, if you could imagine what, the, what is being projected to the cortex, it's not like an image at all. It's a big mishmash of, of stuff and it's, it's, it would be unrecognizable. And somehow we still perceive the world in some sort of crystalline, beautiful thing. If I look out of the world, I don't see this mess. I don't see the holes, you know? So another aspect of the binding problem is like, well, how do all these distorted little pieces of our coming in our sensory organs lead to this percept that's stable and, and uniform and nice. And the same thing can be argued about touch. You know, if you touch something with your hand, you have all these different sensory inputs from different parts of your skin and they're moving all over the place. And yet you perceive that I'm holding this teacup in my hand and it's not moving around and it doesn't feel weird. So these are, this is sort of the, you know, how do our different sensory uh, inputs get united into some sort of singular stable perception? That's the mining problem. And as I said earlier, it's just a moment ago, the, it doesn't look like the brain brings this all to, to one spot. That doesn't what it looks like. And, and the information goes all over. So how can that be understood? So the answer to the, I think, and that what we propose, the answer to the mining problem comes again from these cortical columns that each are a complete modeling system. So we have 150,000 or so of these cortical columns in your neocortex. And each one is trying to model whatever its inputs are. Some are getting inputs from the skin and the and ears and the eyes, other getting inputs from other parts of the neocortex. But they're trying to model something. And each one can take, it sort of has hypothesis of what, it's, what thing it's perceiving. And, um, and they vote, they don't, they don't come together at one spot, they just reach a consensus. And so there's these long range connections that exist in the neocortex that go all over the place, which really don't make any sense at all in a sort of hierarchical form of, of thinking. Um, but they go all from the left side of the brain to the right side of the brain, from low level visual areas to low level auditory areas to low level um, somatosensory areas. None of this makes sense in sort of classic view of hierarchy. But what those connections are doing, we believe, are voting. And so individual columns were saying, okay, I think I'm seeing something. I think I'm seeing, you know, a, a coffee cup is the example I use in the book. And another one saying, I think I'm seeing this part of a coffee cup. Some things I think I'm feeling something that could be this or could be that, but they're not certain. They'd be, there'd be a lot of ambiguity about what each, each column is, is perceiving. Um, but by voting, then they all reach a consensus. And they all say, okay, we all agree that this has got to be a coffee cup. You know, individual columns could have be questioning that, but together, that's the only thing that makes sense. Um, so it's these long range connections uh, and these voting um, um, that brings us our singular perception of the world. And what we perceive, you know, we're going about our day, we don't perceive most of the stuff that's happening in these cortical columns. We, don't, we cannot perceive all the processing that's going on, the, the messy stuff that's happening as your eyes are moving, your fingers are moving but we perceive the, the voting. So the voting neurons are actually stable. They're all saying, yep, we're all looking at a coffee cup at this position, this angle. Um, that's what we're seeing. Even though your eyes are moving around, the inputs, the, the, the columns are changing, the, the, their voting output is the same. And so that's, uh, so that's why we have the single perception and we, we actually aren't unable to perceive the vast majority of what's going on in these cortical columns. Yeah, thanks. Uh... I want to talk about voting in a second. I think that's a key part of it. But first, uh, we should talk about reference frames. 
so you talk about color columns and how and that each color column models the word, but we didn't talk about how. And reference frames can be a hard concept to grasp and an even harder one to materialize into an implementation. And I've seen you describe reference frame as an overcomplete basis set or a graph or a map. Or another interpretation I found useful is reference frames as a manifold in a latent space. So as an engineer, I like the idea of describing constructs in terms of their properties because it helps me to visualize and possibly implement them. So can you describe what a reference frame is in terms of its properties? So what can we expect? Sure. Um, I mean, you know, it's interesting. So many people have trouble understanding reference frames. Um, you know, highly educated people who are not engineers and scientists, some, some of them just, I find I just can't even get this at all, you know? Um, and I say, don't you remember the X, Y, Z coordinates you learned in high school? And they go, eh, not really. <laughs> so, um, uh, so I should point out that, you know, reference frames have been um, um, a useful tool for thinking about cognition for a long time. Um, there's a lot of cognitive theory uh, that's based on use of reference frames. Robotics, people use reference frames. Um, some of the early AI attempts use things called schemas, which are a type of reference frame. Um, but in neuroscience um, and, in, and in most of classic uh, machine learning techniques today, um, re reference frames don't really play a part. And, and so we weren't, as we were studying the brain, we weren't thinking about reference frames in, in, in the cortex. As, as far as I knew, no one had ever really talked about there. But you asked me to describe what their, what their properties are. Um, I'll, I'll try, I'll do the best I can. Um, first of all, uh, in the brain, and I think it's this important part of the theory is that the, the reference frames are tied to movement. So um, these are not some abstract um, mathematical concepts describing some n-dimensional space. These are um, the, the brain model spaces using reference frames uh, that are based on how we move in the world. And so. Uh, if, if a rat could only move in two dimensions in a, in a world, then it would develop two-dimensional reference frames. And if, if, if a bat can move in three-dimensional spaces, it might develop three-dimensional reference frames. Um, and, you know, we don't really know that all the, we, we can't really model most of the world. We, we only subsample as part of the world. And so we could, our, our reference frames are tied to how we move through the world. So in, in fact, the neural tissue um, has to discover what are the right reference frames to use for things. And it's, and it's going to do that through, based on its observed movements. But the, rep, the properties you asked about are several. One is, uh, we like to say they're metric. So you think of a reference frame as a way of specifying locations uh, in, in relative to each other. And a metric means that um, the same, even, very simply, you might say, oh, this, you know, it's, it's not distorted. You know, if I could have a, like a grid, if all the squares in the grid are the same size, so then it's a metric space. I can say, I can measure from any two points. I can say, well, if I go two over and three up, then, then it's gonna be the same distance if I did that same movement from someplace else. Um, so it's not a distorted, uh, you're, you really like it to be a metric space. So you could say how, wh what direction I have to go to get from one point to another point in this, in this reference frame. And I can make, that's the correct answer no matter what, where I start from. Um, that's one property. Another property that um, that is, uh, we know that the brain does this, is, uh, is path integration, which comes from the, being the metric space. Um, path integration is saying, well, if I'm at some location, where will I be if I move in a certain direction and for a certain distance? Or if I move so much to the left and then so much up and then so much to the left again, where will I be? And so you can, without even observing anything, you could just integrate your behaviors over time and, uh, and be pretty, uh, could have a pretty good guess at where you are after doing that. It would be like, you know, getting up out of your bed at night and you're standing next to your bed and you say, okay, well, I'm now gonna take, you know, six steps towards the bathroom. And if it's completely dark and you don't see anything, you're internal, you know, you're no longer at the bed. You can now visualize where you are in that room. You say, now I'm in a different part of the room, um, even though you didn't see anything, you're just doing path integration. So that's another property of reference frames um, that is really key to the whole theory. It's how we make predictions about what will happen when we, if we were, if we were about to make a movement or do something. Um, so um, I think I mean, I'm probably, if anyone wants to speak up, I probably forgot something else, but those are some of the, the key properties of reference frames. All right, thanks. Uh, I think it, 
helps me a lot. So uh, the idea of uh, reference frames is metric space is, uh, so in, in that sense, it's more like a map, right? Would that be a good analogy? Yeah, I use the analogy of maps in, um, in the book a lot, because I think that's one that most people can understand. And I really take that analogy quite far, um, talking about cutting up maps into little squares and how the cortical columns could do all this stuff. Um, yeah, so a map is a good example. Uh, the reference frame of a map would be, uh, it, it could be the latitude and longitude lines, or uh, it could be the, you know, if the map was like a road map and it just had, you know, columns A through F and rows one through 10, something like that. Um, the, it's the, it, the, the reference frame itself is the grid underlying the map. It's just a metric space. And then you populate the reference frame with things that are observed at different locations. So, you know, a map, you say, oh, well, at this point in this map, this is what I observed there. And then, and so you end up by doing this, you, by, you can actually build a model of something. Let's say if it's a map of a town, you would build a model of the town by moving around, observing what you see at different locations um, and mapping, writing down on this map. And then they, now you have this model of the town. It's, it's more complicated than that, but that's the basic idea. Um, you have to, you have to, in reality, you have to, you have to also note the, the orientation of the pose of these objects. And we don't think that you don't have to store them at some location, but th that's the basic idea. Um, and so it's a, that's a useful analogy, although, you know, maps are two-dimensional. Um, the same basic idea uh, works for any dimensional spaces. All right, thanks. Well, so, I'm, glad uh, it, I'm glad it worked for you because yeah, I was trying really hard to figure out how to describe this to people. <laughs> maybe, maybe one thing I could uh, add in, uh, you've often pointed out that unlike sort of Euclidean reference frames, there's no natural origin. There's no zero point. Oh, yeah. And so the map is another useful thing there. If you look at the map, think of the map of the world, there's no natural zero point, but instead you can pick a point, any point, and use that as an anchor or use that as a, kind of, and you can an talk anchor. about things relative to, uh, relative to that, yeah, not maybe not an anchor, but just some. Yeah. You know, you could talk about things relative to that. So, um, so Subhatai, that's a good point, and uh, maybe I should. We should just clarify the way the brain does this is unusual, right? The, the, we know how the neurons do this, uh, and Subhatai, you, you're referring to that. Um, in the brain, we know there's these things called grid cells, and they create a type of reference frame. And one of the, the very, and I'll just re rephrase what you said, Subhatai. One of the surprising things about them is there is no origin to these things. There is no, you know, point of reference. <laughs> um, the way that the way they the way the neurons implement these reference frames, they do it. Uh, we could go into, it, but it's clever. It's complicated. It takes a while to really understand it. Um, um, but you end up with no. There's no points. It's like it's like it's like uh, it's no origin. It's like the, the neurons can represent this huge, huge space um, of possible representations. And um, any particular object you want to assign to a reference, give a reference frame to, it just picks some point in that space, a cloud of points in that space in which to model something. Um, so it's different than we typically think about it uh, in simple mathematics. Is that, is that what you meant to say, Subhutai? Uh Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's fascinating too, by the way. It's, just, it's really amazing um, how it works, but it, it, takes, it takes a while to get your head around it. Um, but then you can understand it pretty easily. <laughs> But that's that's a neural implementation. It's an interesting question whether uh, AI machines will have to do it that way. Um, we can talk about that later, maybe. Or now. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. No. Sure. Uh, let's explore that. So, so, so what are what are your views on that? Do you think we should follow that exact implementation, or or is that do yeah, you see a better way of doing that? Well, it's, it's certainly not the way most people would do it. You know, you take an engineer or a scientist, they would think of more like a typical sort of Cartesian coordinates, right? And you have an origin and you have, you know, multiple um, um, orthogonal axes that you use to define a reference frame. Um, well, brain does it differently. Uh, it appears at the moment that, that the brain has, as you said, an overcomplete set of uh, vectors, if you, uh, dimensions, if you will. So it might take a three-dimensional space and represent it by 50 different um, um, dimensions. Um, so it's an overcomplete set. Um, and it has these interesting properties of, of these grid cells where there's no origin and, and how they work and so on. So now the question is, do you have to do it the way the brain does it or not? And I don't have the answer to that question. Uh, as a general rule, and, and if you've been around Dementor for a while and you know this, um, as a general rule, I think it's very, um, it's very risky to move away from what we know the neuroscience does 
if we're trying to build an AI system, it's very risky to move away from the neuroscience until you completely understand the neuroscience because the neuroscience has got these tricks and just over and over again surprises us with things like, oh, I wouldn't have done that. Oh, I'm surprised. And then you find that these properties that come from the way the neurons do this that you don't get other ways. Um, I mean, the, the biggest, simplest example is sparsity, right? Most people, when we, we design computers and electronics, we don't build sparse systems. We build dense representations. Ones, all ones and zeros are equal, but the brain uses sparsity. And so it's, most of the neurons are off or silent and only a few percent are on. Well, that's not an optional thing, right? It turns out there's some really interesting computational properties that come from sparsity. And so I don't, I don't think you can build you know, intelligent machines using dense representations. Um, and so the same question could come around for the reference frames. And at the moment, I would, I would say I would be uh, very, very, I would be confident, but not 100% confident that um, we're going to have to incorporate some of the properties that, that, that neurons, how they implement reference frames. Um, and that we shouldn't just say, okay, we can start doing this, you know, like a roboticist might do. And they'll just say, okay, this is a simple problem. We're just going to define each joint on the robotic arm and give it its own, its own reference frame and its own orientation. And we can do the mathematics to calculate where the hand is. Well, that works, but it may prevent you from actually doing getting all the desirable properties that we have um, as we move out in the world. Um, and so at the moment, I would be very cautious to, to, to say, well, I don't need to know those details, um, how the brain does this. Uh, I would say you're probably going to need to know these details eventually. Yeah, I no, promise that though. 100% agree with you on that. So you just mentioned sparsity as being one of the key elements, uh, which is maybe missing in modern machine learning implementations. So can you elaborate on that? Do you see sparsity as a, a functional requirement of the wetware? Like you, you need it to keep it running at 30 watts without exceeding a heating threshold? Or is it a key property of how the brain learns? It's, well, it's a key property how the brain learns and works and represents information. Um, th there's no doubt about that. Um, so I, I don't think it's optional in any way. Um, just to be clear, there's, there's all kinds of sparsity that we have, we're talking about. Uh, one type of sparsity um, is as you have a whole bunch of neurons and, and you want to represent something. Um, well, the brain does it by activating a very small percentage of those neurons. So if I have 10,000 neurons and I activate 2% of them, I'll have 200 active neurons. Um, and it's only going to use 200 active. It never is going to use you know, 5,000 neurons to represent something. And so it's a few ones and mostly zeros. Um, and that, that's an activation sparsity. There's also sparsity of connections between like, you know, if, uh, if, I wanna, if I want to recognize a pattern that's 200 active neurons, do I have to connect to all 200 neurons to recognize a pattern? And it turns out, no, you only have to connect to about 30 or 20 of them. And so you can sparsely connect to a pattern. Um, so there's a whole bunch of advantages to sparsity but mostly I think of it as, as, a, as the advantage all fall into sort of the, the concept of representation. If you think about dense representations in a computer, you know, uh, every, you can take 32 or 64 bits and you can say, well, I can represent two to the 64 different patterns with those 64 bits. And uh, that's great. Um, but the problem is if you have a single error uh, in one of those bits, the whole thing gets screwed up, right? And, and so you can't have, you have to have this perfect accuracy and there's no, there's no relationship between the bits. If I look two bit patterns, I can't say if they're, they're related or not. You know, the, 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 I go from, you know, uh, you know if, the, if I'm just counting up uh, uh, integers using binary, I, you know, I can flip all the bits in one, one fell swoop between two adjacent numbers. So, um, but with sparse representations, you get all these wonderful properties. You get, you get a very large representational space. It's, it's much smaller than a dense space, but it's still more than the number of atoms in the universe. You know, you can say how many ways you can choose 200 out of 10,000. It's a very astronomical number. Um, you're very robust, meaning if I, if I add a lot of noise, either to the, the, to the you know, drop out a bunch of the ones and since to kill a bunch of neurons, um, the patterns still are recognized. I don't get confused. I can add a lot of noise to the whole system. Nobody gets confused. Um, there are these other, another property we rely on a lot is called the union property, um, where if I say, okay, I have 10,000 neurons, 200 are active, that represents something. Now I say, what if I activate two patterns at the same time? So now I have roughly 400 bits active, um, a little bit less, and I activate a third pattern, a fourth pattern. Well, now I've mixed in all these patterns together. Um, and so, and so you, you might have thought I've messed the whole system up, but the system will still work. It'll still process all those patterns simultaneously without getting confused. 
So it's a, it's a different way of representing uncertainty that, that neurons can represent multiple patterns at the same time using the same neurons um, and up to a certain point and, and nobody gets lost. The, you, know, you can process in parallel multiple things at once. So that's another property of sparse representations, which is uh, we rely on a lot. Um, uh, you know, there was a, in our uh, 2016 paper titled um, um, uh, Why do the Neurons Have Thousands of Synapses? Um, Subutai did a nice little analysis, I think it was in that paper, uh, did a nice little analysis of sparsity and some of the mathematical properties of them. Uh, and we've also done some other ones since. Uh, Why So Dense is another paper we've been. So um, uh, we think it's fundamental. Um, and in our current work right now, as, as you know, um, we, and as long as a lot of other machine learning researchers are now trying to apply sparse uh, principles to uh, convolutional neural networks and deep learning networks and various sort of modern uh, neural networks. So is sparsity present only at a neural level within a cortical column or also between a at a cortical column level? So only a few cortical columns will be active at any point in time. Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if I know the answer to that question. It certainly, sparsity occurs, it's, first of all, not everywhere in the brain is sparse, not every part of the, the neural tissue in, of all parts of your brain are sparse. But when you get to the cortex, it's a prominent feature uh, and different types of cell population at different levels of sparsity. Um, but, um, you know, you asked me about columns, are columns sparse activated? Well, I think I can say this pretty certainly. Imagine you have 150,000 columns in your, in, your, in your cortex. And we say, well, how many of those columns are going to learn? In the example in the book, I used to talk about the, you know, the Nementa coffee cups. Here's my Nementa coffee cup. So I said, how many columns are going to represent that coffee cup it, it, are going to have models of that coffee cup? And it's not going to be all 150,000. It's going to be a small subset of them. It's not going to be two. It's going to be probably a few thousand. And that's where the, the, the term a thousand brains theory comes from. Um, so you're going to have a, if I, if I ask myself, um, which columns, how many columns are going to represent any particular thing, it will be a sparse a set of columns out of a very large set of columns. But you asked a different question, which is, will they be active? And I'm trying to think on my feet here about that. What are all the other columns doing at that moment in time? And I don't really have a good answer to that. Um, I would say probably that um, many of the columns would be, um, would with the inactive completely, I, nothing's ever inactive completely in the brain. Um, so I, I would say probably, but I really don't know the answer to that question. It's, 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 I've never asked that question. I haven't thought about it before. So it tripped me up a little bit. <laughs> so, so in that case, so given a, for a given input and a reference frame that's being learned, how do you guarantee that only that specific subnetwork of neurons or specific subnetwork of cortical columns we are interested in is activated? Uh, well, you, again, you, you want to talk about neurons within a column or a subset of columns of all the columns? Well, let's talk about neurons within a column then. So how do you guarantee that we only activate the neurons we want for that better, for that specific input and reference frame being there? Well, I, I, when you say with that we want, there's a sort of a, a suggestion that we there's some desired goal. I'm not sure what you what you mean by what we want. We can, we can say the following, um, in, the, in the neocortex, 80% uh, of the neurons are excitatory cells. And these are the ones we mostly think about when we think about uh, representing something. And 20% of the neurons are inhibitory cells, which keep the excitatory cells from getting too excited. Um, and so these are everywhere. Uh, and there's different types, um, but it, it's generally built into the tissue that the neural tissue does, it wants to be sparse. It just, it's just sort of, it, it's just, trying to be sparse all the time. And you never want to, there is, there's basically gain control everywhere <laughs> that says we cannot form, you know, dense representations. That, that's like a seizure and we don't want that. Um, so this is built into the neural tissue that sparsity is itself um, almost in guaranteed and enforced by the mechanisms of the inhibitory cells. Um, and now you, but you asked then the question of, well, how do we know we get the right response? I, I don't know what that means, the right response. I mean. You know, some responses are driven by sensory input. Some are driven by our motor behaviors. Um, they should reflect what the sensory input should be. They should reflect what the motor behavior should be. Some are representing locations, so they should reflect the locations. Each of these cell populations has its own mechanisms for determining what the right representation is. Um, and, um, and so I think, you know, if you want to get down to like, well, 
what's the right representation for any particular cell population? Well, we have to get into very specifics of what that cell, cell population is representing. Um, and, um, and, and maybe you meant something a little bit simpler than that. Maybe you meant something like, well, how do I reckon, and I'm recognizing the right object or something like that. Um, but you didn't say that, so I'm not sure what you meant. No, no, I, I think you're on the right track there. So, so you're saying that sparsity is, uh, the representation is about sparse as well. So sparse is defining the representation. Uh, um, how can I put that? So it's not just about which neurons are we using, but the fact that we are using those neurons are the representation itself, right? And that's, I think, how sparse distributed representations are built. It, it's about which neurons are active and, and not about you know, like this notion of weight that we have in deep learning or how yeah, much. I, well, it's, oh, all right, well, you're, that's introducing a new topic, which is, I mean, you, are you asking about activation level versus population coding? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, no. yeah, you could say okay. that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, um, there's a, both are going on in the brain in, in different places. You know, this review, what we're talking about here, one way you might say, oh, well, how, how active a neuron is, it, it tells you what it's representing. Like, I, you know, and, and deep learning networks, or artificial neural networks based on this idea that the activation levels um, of all the different neurons matter greatly. Um, but, um, uh, but, but when you deal with sparse codes, almost all the information is in the, is in the population code, not in the activation level. I, I think there are, I think both of these exist in the cortex. Uh, we, we can get into the more details here that we hadn't um, get into. But if I, if I take like five, 10,000 neurons and I say, you know, 200 active, almost all the information is in, um, is in the code and not in the activation levels. Um, however, there are other parts of the cortical tissue which are less sparse. If we think about activation of mini columns or something like that, and where you have maybe a, a few dozen different items and a, a handful are active. Well, those are that's the the, uh, the rate coding there is going to be more important. So it's not it's not black and white, um, but I would say it, it both exists rate coding and population coding. Um, but I think most people have missed and understood the, the importance of population coding um, in, in in a lot of research. Uh, so um, and, and and that's really where most of the power comes from. So I don't know if I can answer the question or not. I'm trying to. Uh, no, 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 no. You, you, they're you're hard good. questions. Some of these, you know, there's not straight answers to them. All right. uh, I have harder questions. <laughs> OK. So, so does the theory predict fully redundant cortical columns as we have multiple cortical columns with the same inputs predicting the same object? Or do we have uh, multiple cortical columns predicting the same object, but each one has a different input? So it's similar to the concept of bagging that we have in statistical learning theory. It's more, it's more the latter. The, I, it's, it's, I wouldn't say there's redundancy. It's, it's not like, oh, this is a redundant machine. We're gonna make three copies of something and compare, you know, compare their outputs and make sure that you know, which ones are correct or something like that. Every cortical column in essence has its own inputs. Um, now, um, it's not the saying that two columns couldn't have very similar inputs, but they're different. Even if I'm two columns looking at two different patches from the retina or two different patches on your skin, uh, that are next to each other, those inputs are different. They're not always going to be the same. And um, each column is going to do its own modeling. Um, uh, you can even think of like a visual column. Some columns might get, um, might rely on, on color and other columns may not have color uh, or less color input. And they can both model the visual world. And so you might, and so you might have a model that's more reliant on the properties of the, of the grayscale and the low light you can get with that versus some that might be more focused on uh, color differences. Um, and so I think the general way to look at it, there's no redundancy. You just got a lot of columns. Each one is modeling its own thing. Even if multiple columns are getting input from the same sensory organs, such as the skin or the ear or the eyes, they're not going to build identical models. They're not being copied. Um, they are in, they some sense learn independently to some extent. And, um, and so they're, you, but on the other hand, you could knock out a bunch of these columns and the system works just fine, right? So the, the, it's not, it's, in that sense, it looks like it's redundant, but it's not really. You know, maybe if I knocked out a few of these columns, I might lose some of my color sensitivity, but I'll still see the world fine. I wouldn't even notice that I've lost some, some of my color sensitivity. Um, you know, I might, um, uh, you know, there's, you know, for some reason, I've lost some touch sensation in my, in my face. Uh, I don't know why that is, but I have. 
And so I can't always feel things on my face, but I feel pretty normal. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's not like I'm lost in the world. Um, so, um, uh, they're, uh, so these are, these are not redundant. They're very complementary. They can overlap a lot in what they learn, uh, but it also makes the system extremely robust uh, in the sense that, you know, you could drop out many of these columns and the system still works just fine. Okay. So, so to combine these columns, we need to vote, right? Which is a, I think a key component of the thousand brain series. So let's talk yeah. about that. So th there are many ways we can vote, right? So voting between different models is the whole subfield of machine learning. And in HTM, for example, we, we explore this idea of voting as unions of sparse distributed binary representations. And like I did with reference frames, I wanted to try to deconstruct the idea of this voting mechanism into a set of properties that we can use as requirements to build a system. So can you, can you talk about the importance of voting and what are these key properties that define the, define the voting mechanism in the brain? Well, again, I can talk about the neuroscience um, more than I can talk about the analogs in machine learning. Uh, I know there, of course, are many, uh, as you point out, there's many different types of uh, voting paradigms in machine learning. Um, again, if, you, if, you're, if your head is down in the world of neuroscience for many years, like mine was, um, this idea was a novel in the neuroscience world. And again, maybe it wasn't so novel in other fields, but it was pretty novel in the neuroscience world. Um, and, and so we didn't start out by saying, oh, we need to vote. We, we kind of said, oh, these columns are building these models, yet we have this, this, this um, and each model is changing as your inputs are changing, your eyes are moving and all these things are changing. Yet we have the singular perception. And it's like, how do you get the singular perception? That was like, we talked about the binding problem. And so the, um, the whole idea of voting came out of that as opposed to uh, uh, some sort of machine learning concept. It was more like, hey, how do we have the singular perception of the world? And, and, and so when you think about your perception, if I'm looking out at something, looking out my window right now, um, and I see other things and I see them at distances, well, my neurons are voting on what am I seeing and what their pose is relative to me right now. That's what they're voting on. And that's, that's what I perceive. So what are the properties? I can talk about how voting occurs in the neurons and we can maybe try to tease out some of the properties about that. In the brain, um, a key part of the voting is this union property we talked about earlier that um, if, a, if a column has you know, um, 10,000 neurons that are representing uh, something uh, and it, an object identity, for example, and um, it's not certain what the object is, it can invoke multiple, a union of representations at the same time saying, well, I don't know, it could be any one of these things. Um, and other columns nearby are doing the same thing. Um, and you could think of it as a way of them all coming to agreement. Like what is the thing that makes most, that really makes the sense for us all right now? It's, it's a little bit, it's more sophisticated than this, but it's a little bit of like, uh, you can think of it, it's sort of like, you know, the, um, well, anyway, it, that's the basic idea. And, and so the mechanism underlying voting um, in, uh, in the brain is it's not like I have a probability distribution uh, because the unions aren't really a probability distribution. They're not, they don't sum the one and, you know, it's, it's like, it's like, you know, it could be these five things and they're all equally likely right now, but, but, you know, they're all good. Um, and, and we want to eliminate the ones that don't, that don't, aren't consistent with other columns. And so a couple of interesting properties about the neuroscience, like, I'm not sure I will get to your question exactly because I don't know how to answer it. A couple of interesting questions about neuroscience. Let's say I have thousands of these columns each one has 10,000 neurons representing some, something they're gonna vote on. Um, in any, any one of these columns, 200 of those things would be you know, one object and 200 cells would be another object, 200 cells. So you might have you know, 1,000 cells active in each of these you know, thousands of columns and they have to make, learn these connections between them. The well, first thing that's interesting about it is not all columns have to connect to all other columns. In fact, um, you can have a very, very sparse connectivity between these columns, meaning, um, it's important that the whole network settles, but not everybody has to be connected to everyone. So if I was, if I would say a column and I'm, I have to get input from, uh, maybe I have to, to, to do my voting, I need to get you know, uh, five, 10,000 other uh, axons coming into me. Well, those 10,000 axons could come from any set of columns all over the place. It doesn't really matter. I could randomly sample where they're coming from and the whole system will settle. Um, so that's an unusual property of them. Um, and um, the mechanism is pretty straightforward and easy. Um, to make this work. Um, so, but what is the fundamental, you know, requirements for voting? Um, I, maybe someone else could help me on this. Um, I'm not sure I have a good answer for that. 
Um, you know, could you do it other ways? Maybe, um, probably. Um, I think the idea is that you have to, everyone has to come to, you know, the, the most copacetic agreement about their hypotheses. And there, there could be lots of ways of doing that, I suppose. I think one of the kind of fundamental properties we talked about in the kind of the columns paper is that you can, in a, you know, cortical columns are getting evidence from their input. They have these multiple hypotheses that they represent and they can integrate evidence in two different ways. One is spatially, you can get information from lots of different cortic other cortical columns um, and you come to a consistent interpretation of which hypotheses are most like, are most consistent with all of the information available at a particular point in time. But you can also integrate information over time as you move your senses around and gather more information like you know, touching your coffee cup or whatever, you can sort of narrow down that, uh, that evidence. So um, or you can narrow down the set of hypotheses. So there's two sort of orthogonal ways of narrowing things down. And this allows you to very, very rapidly come to a consistent interpretation. Yeah. So I think those are two, uh, you know, uh, two things, uh, two, two sort a, of separate That's a great that point. Pretty... It's not really a voting question, but it's really sort of the fundamental issue how the whole system works, right? It's, it's, remember every column is a complete sensory motor system, right? Modeling system. So what Subutai is saying is, you know, you can, a single column from, from your finger, let's say, um, can learn and infer a cup or object just by moving over time. And, in, and of course you'd have to move over time to do that because it, one touch isn't sufficient. And the visual equivalent would be looking at the world through a very narrow straw. You know, you can't see everything, but you can move it around. So I'm just paraphrasing what Supertype brought up is that columns can resolve ambiguity by movement. Um, that's the, the, the default way, but they can, they can, they can um, also resolve ambiguity by voting. Uh, which is sort of the supplemental way in some in some way, uh, the fundamental mechanism is through movement. And so, as Subutai just said, if you vote, you can you can uh, reduce the amount of uh, movement you have to do to to infer or to recognize something. All right, and you, you mentioned that we have so the cardinal columns have to settle into a stable pattern. Does that imply that the voting mechanism is loop? over a lot of uh, multiple iterations where you try to settle into a stable pattern or can you do voting in just uh, one, one iteration? Uh, well, I, I mean, it obviously takes some amount of time to resolve the voting, right? Um, neurons don't have a clock. <laughs> They're not working on, uh, you know, passes through some coding loop. So um, I think from a neuron point of view, um, it's just a natural settling process of, you know, uh, um, it will take a little bit of time, but it's very, very fast. I don't, it wouldn't, you know. Yeah, it was really, at least the mechanism we proposed was extremely fast. The, the, yeah. the neurons that are getting kind of most evidence laterally through their distal dendrites will be stronger and they will uh, kind of com compete and beat out the other neurons that are not getting as much, so it, uh, as much evidence. So it does take a little bit of time, but it's super fast. You could think about, you know, I use the example in the book of these bistable images like uh, everyone's seen the vase and the, uh, that looks like two faces, right? And, and you look at that and it's the same visual input and then it, it instantly switches between vase and you sit there for a vase for a while and then, it, oh, now I see the faces and you see the faces for a while and then now I see the vase. You can't see them both at the same time. And, and what's literally going on in that situation is these voting neurons just, they're locking in quickly onto one of the, um, a pattern that says, okay, this is consistent with being a vase. And for some reason, we don't know why, but some, there's some mechanism that says, okay, enough of that. Is there another, <laughs> is there another interpretation? <laughs> and it locks in the next one. It's, it's just the exact same evidence. There's no change in the evidence. Um, there's two interpretations, um, but that switch is very rapid. You don't, you don't go through like a period of time where you're going, well, I see a little bit of Oz, I see a little bit of face. And it goes, bam, you know, it just locks in. Mm -hmm. so, so are you saying that we have an initial answer? Uh, so this is uh, uh, two faces. But voting continues in the background, and at some point, uh, you can decide on another thing, and boom, then now we see a face. I, I, that's what I think is going yeah. on, and it's, it's very consistent with the mechanism. All it, what it requires, beyond what Subutai just said, is it requires there's some sort of um, mechanism that that either fatigues or uh, forces a new um, a new interpretation. You know, so the neurons say, okay, we can only do this for so long, and now let's try something else. I, I don't know what that mechanism is. Maybe somebody, maybe someone has discovered it in some neuroscience research. Um, but the point of that story was 
that there are two interpretations of the evidence that are both can be consistent and they both can be voted on and, they, and that switch happens very rapidly and you're not, you don't spend any time in intermediate states thinking about it. <laughs> like, you know, you don't, you never see the vase in the face at the same time. You know they're there, but you can't really perceive them at the same time. It's not like you're not, you're not aware that you're going to see them both, but you just can't. It's just the perception doesn't exist, you know. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's great. So those are questions I always had about voting in the thousand brains. So let's talk about movement a little bit. Um, that's, I think, a very important aspect you mentioned right in the beginning. And one of the key ideas we have in, in predictive processing is that movement can be used to disambiguate, meaning uh, during learning, we are driven towards actions that will help us capturing the missing pieces of the puzzle and then improve our understanding of something. So in the thousand brains theory, to what extent cortical columns control movement and how do we deal with each cortical column requiring a different piece to complete its puzzle? So each one deciding to execute a different movement to collect that input. Yeah. So um, the first part of that question, it's a physical observation of the brain that um, in the neocortex, there's a certain cell population. Uh, it's in these layer, it's in layer five. It's called these layer five intrinsically bursting pyramidal cells. Okay. These cells send their axon out of the neocortex someplace else in the brain. Um, and wherever they send their, their, it's related to movement. So these are the movement output cells in the neocortex. So like I'm speaking right now, there's parts of, there's cells in my uh, language areas in my cortex that are firing right now. Um, and those are layer five cells and they project down to areas with, with, that, that would control my voice box and breathing and things like that. So we, now the surprising thing about these cells, they're, they're kind of unique, you can see them, they're, they're well known, is that apparently they exist in every cortical column. They, they don't exist in motor areas of the brain. That's what people used to think many years ago, like, oh, there's a motor section of the brain. Well, not really, that's just the motor somatosensory section. <laughs> um, but even like primary visual cortex, the first columns that get input from the eyes have these cells which project and create movement. And they project back to a part of the old brain called the superior colliculus, which is involved in controlling the movement of the eyes. Uh, and so it's, you, you can't, the evidence is super strong that you can't really separate out movement from sensation. They're, it's part of the part and parcel of the same tissue. And this of course has been pretty much ignored in many, many models of vision and other things. Um, and um, it's hard to avoid it if you're trying to think of modeling something with touch or, but you can avoid it with the hearing and vision. But it's a, it's a rule that in general, even the parts of the cortex that are getting um, input from your ears project back down to the parts of your body that move your head and orient your head in different directions in the same way as like moving your eyes. So there, it's, it's integrated there. Um, and of course, the whole theory as we just talked about is that you know, we, we learn and we infer through movement, right? It, it, the simple gambling, you just think about looking at the world through a straw or touching an object with one finger, that's like close to like one column that's moving and building a model of something by, by integrating its location, uh, where it's viewing something in, in space in a reference frame and building a model of something based on sensing at different locations. And you can integrate this together in a single column to build a model of an object. So one of the thousand things the thousand brain theory says is that even low level visual regions of the cortex are building complete models of the world because they can integrate over time. Um, now, the second part of your question is harder to answer which is how do these columns um, um, integrate their different movements? I think that's what you're asking, right? Um, so yeah, <laughs> uh, it's interesting if you think about vision, well, all the cortical columns getting input from the retina, they have to somehow agree on the movement because your eyes can either move one way or the other. You can't move them both ways at the same time, right? So that's a situation where, okay, somehow the, in a way that I don't understand yet, they're going to agree that okay, there's one there's one movement we're going to make right now, <laughs> and, and we've agreed that it's going to be go this way. Um, uh, when you come to something like your fingers and your hands and your limbs, it's different, right? My fingers can move independently of each other somewhat, and and so they don't all have to agree. But there are patches of my finger that are, are going to have to move together. Um, but the patches in the next finger over can move independently of that. And they may be represented right next to each other in the cortex. So in the cortex, the, the columns representing this finger and this finger might be right next to each other, but they're going to generate different behaviors. Um, one could say extend, one can say flex, um, something like that. 
Um, we don't have a, we haven't developed a, a, a concrete theory about this yet, about how they communicate with each other to form coordinated movements. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I just gave you some of the parameters around it. Sometimes it's, they all move together. Sometimes they move partially together and partially not. Um, it doesn't, they can move independently. Even, even columns are right next to each other in the cortex could be generating movements that are different movements. Sometimes they generate the same movement. Um, but beyond that, we don't really have a good sense for it yet. Or like how would I would do this um, and, and create this very complex uh, set of movements that we would typically exhibit with uh, say a limb and, and grabbing something. Um, uh, but I'm sure it can be solved. I just don't have the answer to that yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to be an optimist, right? You got to say like, there's an answer to these questions. And, and the best thing you can do is just sort of tease apart the problem, as you said earlier, defining the problem and, and putting parameters around it and say, okay, well, it has to do this and it has to do this and it has to do that and it has to do that. And we know this. So what can be the answer? And, and somehow if you spend enough time thinking about it, usually the answer comes to you. Uh, so uh, I want to switch gears a little bit to talk about uh, reinforcement learning. I think that's a question that comes up a lot. So in reinforcement learning, we generally divide algorithms between model-free and model-based. Uh, and the latter requires the agent to learn a model of the world that can be used to predict future state dependent on current state. And we have this middle ground with a successful representation where the, the agent learns the model of the world, but that model also imbues a prediction of its policies of its behavior. So the, models, uh, the model that the agent learned knows which regions of the state space are visited more frequently. And then it can use that information to better predict uh, future states or prioritize how information is stored and retrieved. So if you think about a map, if you know that you're going more to like the center of the town, you have you know the center of the town drawn in, in more details, you know, better directions. Whereas if you don't go to the, the border of the town, that it's going to be a little bit more blurry. So is that idea of success representation uh, contrary to the thousand brains, or, or is it on the same line? How well, as 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 uh, you know, as 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 I've talked to you in the past, because you know, these are concepts that I'm not super familiar with. Um, I think obviously the thousand brain theory is a model based theory, right? It's 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 a model of uh, not a, you are predicting what you're going to sense as you move. It's not um, a model just predicts what your behavior should be at any point in time. Um, it, and I think that's maybe the distinction we're making there. Um, and um, but I think you're you're asking these questions about um, exploring this, the state space or exploring the space of, of the world. And, and I'm not sure if this is the question you're asking, but like, uh, what do we, you know, there are models that say, okay, uh, an agent should spend so much time exploring novel places because um, you don't know what you're going to learn. And an agent may say, no, it's safer to explore the previously explored spaces because um, that's less dangerous, <laughs> maybe something like that. Um, is your question related to that? Um, yeah, maybe a different way to put it is, is is the model we build uh, dependent on behavior? So do we take that into account to decide, you know, how do we model uh, and with which parts of the model are we going to dedicate more uh, information pieces to it, or or is it independent? So we just learn a model of the world that we could just attach to any behavior, and we, we don't really take that into account. All right, I'm I'm gonna have to uh, maybe somebody can help me on this one. Um, I mean, you can't separate behavior from how you learn and infer, right? Um, so um, maybe it's more like, uh, you know, you have some sort of a complex goal you want to achieve. You yeah. Know, how do you decide what movements to make to achieve those in the most efficient way? And you, you know, if you have to explore a lot of different places uh, or different sensory well, okay. states, you know, maybe you don't want to go back somewhere you visited before, you know, how yeah. do you kind of Make, well, the, uh, the, general, the, the general answer to the question is how do you achieve a goal? If you have a good model of the world, then, that, then the model tells you how to achieve that goal. Even if, it, even if it's a goal you've never done before. We talked earlier about metric spaces. And one of the nice things about metric spaces is that you can, uh, you can describe, you can decide what are the behaviors you need to do to achieve a goal, even if you've never actually achieved that goal from the particular position you're in. You know, the, the simple example is, you know, you, you're... Um, you're, you're walking around town and you know where the library is and you know where the, the post office is. And you've never, you've gone from your home to the post office and you've gone from your home to the library. You've never gone from the library to the post office. So you know how to get from your home to the post office, but now you're at the library 
but by having a model of the town, you know, you can you can say exactly how you get from the post up and uh, from the, the the post office to the library, or whatever which way I said it. Um, even though you've never done that before, that's what you get from having a metric based space uh, and a model of the town. Um, I think now you're maybe you're introducing the question subtype perhaps is that what if I'm trying to achieve a goal that I really don't have an obvious way how to do it? Um, uh, what should my behaviors be? Is that the question then? If, sorry, if I can add yeah, on, the, on the town example. So let's say uh, you have the post office in the, in the town center, but you never had to use the post office, post office before. So you, you go by every day, post office there, but you never had to use it. So when you do have to use the post office, is that going to be already part of your model? So you can just yeah, go in and yes, do it? it will be. Yeah, or, you, you, you're going to learn everything. As if I, I mean, let, let's say I, I just were, you drop me off in a new town, it's a sunny day, and I just start walking around, right? I will learn that town. I will learn, I will remember what I saw at different locations. Now, and, and I will build up a model as I walk around. Now, to take a real human doing this. That model may not be very long left lived. You might forget things very quickly. You might, you know, an hour later, you might've forgotten what was on that corner back there or something like that. And if something very important happened, you might remember it longer. And so if something emotionally salient happened, you might say, oh my God, I remember that intersection. That's where the accident occurred. Um, so we can, we can separate out that sort of longevity of the memory from the basic process. The basic process is you observe, you assign what you observe to a reference frame. You observe, you move, you go to a new location, you observe, you assign what you learn to the reference frame. You move, you observe, you assign what you learn to the new location in the reference frame. That basic process is how, so if you, you wouldn't go past the post office and not notice where the post office was. Um, you could forget it very quickly. Again, I can say that you might not remember it very long, but that basic process is you remember it. Um, uh, the example that I think Marcus first came up with, but I use now a lot, um, is you know you sit down at your dining room table and you see where all the dishes are for tonight's dinner, and you see all the salads over here and the potatoes over there and the, and the vegetable casseroles over here, something like that. And in an instant, you remember that you built the map of the table, you know. And so if, if I could close my eyes and say, "Where is the where is the vegetable casserole?" I can reach for it, you know. So you do this all the time, but I'll forget that later, or maybe after I move the dishes around in, in, in a minute, I'll have a new map. So these maps are constantly being created. And they're constantly being remembered, whether it's the town or the uh, things on your table. So yes, the, you will learn this model. And if you have observed it, you will learn it. And um, you might forget it, but you will learn it. And so in this case, we're talking about if I, you know, if I'm walking around town and I've never need to use the post office board, but I, I recognize I saw that I know what a post office was. And someone says, you know, how do you get to the post office? I'll remember, I'll know how to get there. I, I don't, I won't necessarily remember how to get there. I'll remember where it is. And they'll be able to calculate from where I am, where would I go to get to the post office? Um, animals can do this very well. So this is you know, the kind of thing that rats do all the time, things like that. Um, insects do this. Um, so in that sense, we have this model of the world. Did I, so I'm not, if you answer, if I answer no, the question. No, no, you, you did, you did, yeah, yeah. So, so this first question was about how behavior influences the model we build. So my second question is how the goal influences the model we build. So do you see do you see learning as a combination of goal-oriented learning, like possibly through a basal ganglion circuit and yeah. just model learning, or are those two independent concepts and the goal-oriented learning just use uh, learn models but doesn't influence it directly? It's, it's a, a great question and, and interesting thought. We were first and foremost just trying to understand how the model comes about at all. You know, how is knowledge represented in the brain? How can you do these things? How can you perceive things? Now you can, you can discuss that in the principles like we were just doing without bringing up any kind of motivations or goals. You know, I could wander around town aimlessly just enjoying the day and build a model of the town. I don't have to be achieving anything. But clearly as biological organisms, um, we are heavily influenced by goals and motivations. And so um, we don't typically just wander around randomly. We might be looking for food or we might be looking for shelter or we might be looking for you know, friends or something like that. Um, and so, and so and, and those, but those emotional states or those goal-driven states, um, I like to think like you just said, are not in the cortex, they're more in the, in the basal ganglia. They're, these are, the cortex is sort of like this, uh, for a large part, is this indifferent map of the world 
Um, and other parts of the brain can assign goals at any point in time. They can say, you know, I'm hungry. You know, you're going to find some food um, uh, or, you know, whatever. And, um, and, and those, the other parts of the brain can actually influence what is learned or the, or the longevity of what is learned. As I mentioned earlier, if I saw an accident at the intersection and it was very emotionally traumatizing to see this accident, I'm going to remember that. The cortex in some sense, didn't decide to remember that. It was, it's more like some other part of the brain says, oh my God, this is really dangerous. You, you don't want to forget this. And, and it, it, it floods the neocortex with, with uh, neuromodulators and, and that will essentially say, remember this, don't forget this. You know? So you're just going to form the same synapses in some sense as you did before, but these are going to be more permanent. And of course, there's these interactions between the lower the basal ganglia, the emotional centers of the brain and the cortex. So you know, when, when you see something, it can, it can, through an associated memory, invoke the emotional response for something, but the emotional response is not coming from the cortex itself. It's coming from these other emotional centers. Um, and similarly, you know, an emotional center can influence what the cortex is going to, the goals it's going to achieve and, and how it's going to perceive things. Um, but we like to think of the cortex first, you know, just understand how it works independent of those um, effective um, issues. And um, just, you know, what is the basic mechanism for how information is stored? And then we can later layer on these uh, goals uh, to achieve certain things. So to try and put what you said in machine learning terms, I think it will be fair to say that uh, goal, uh, goal is not the objective function that we're optimizing for, but goal is modulating learning. I would learning. say it's, yes, that's what I would say. Um, and I would say that with a bit of, um, humility and like, well, it could be much more complicated than I'm thinking about it. Uh, but that's how I think about it right now. Yes. And, you know, anytime you're trying to solve a difficult problem, you have to parcel out the part that you're going to, you can't solve it all at once. You have to parcel out the part you're trying to solve <laughs> and you say, what can I ignore for now? And so we've been taking that approach um, that it's really like, okay, these goals and the emotional states associated with them are going to modulate learning. And therefore we don't have to worry about them right now. Um, uh, it may turn out to be less simple than that, um, but I think we can get a pretty good understanding of what's going on in the cortex by by doing that. All right. So um, I had a, a few implementations, a uh, few questions about implementation. So we know static image recognition is not a good way to train or evaluate uh, general intelligence agents. I, I think I heard you talk about this before. So how do you think we should experiment with and evaluate intelligent agents? Or in other words, what are the requirements to build an experiment environment for AGI? And when do you, you know if any- Experimental environment, like uh, what machine learning people would do, um, what kind of benchmarks we'd have. Yes. All right, so I know, I know Lucas, you're much more of an expert than, this, than I am, because I know you're working on this. Um, but um, I will, I'll address that in a more meta answer, if I can. Uh, and I make the point of this in the book, in the second part of the book. I think the way we are thinking about machine learning benchmarks today is not how we're gonna think about them in the future. And I make the analogy to computers. Um, when computers were first starting to be built, this is before, you know, back in the thirties, um, um, they were very goal oriented, they were task oriented devices. Like we're gonna build a computer that cracks a code or we're gonna build a computer that solves, you know, build these mathematical tables and how good is it at doing that? But we moved towards the, the sort of general purpose, you know, uh, universal Turing machine concept where we ask ourselves, well, what's a computer? We no longer say, we say, is it a universal Turing machine? Well, does it have the following attributes? Does it have a memory for data store? Does it have instruction sets? Does it have a CPU? Does it have an input and output? And if it has those, those things, we're calling a general purpose computer and we don't longer worry about what it's doing. I can, I can apply that to running my toaster. I can apply it to running my car. I can apply it to different things. Um, and I think AI is eventually, I'm not predicting it's gonna do this right now, but it eventually move in the same direction we will be, and I, I made the argument for this in the book, that we have to define a set of attributes that artificial intelligence, intelligent machines have. And if they have that set of attributes, we will no longer argue whether they're intelligent. And, and it's the same way, like I could say a cat is intelligent, a rat, a rat is intelligent, and a human is intelligent. We're just different scales, but we all have those components. We all have a neocortex. We all perceive the world. We all learn the model of the world through the same methods. And that's the way AI has to get eventually. 
we have to look at saying, okay, do we have all the ingredients for being an intelligent machine? Yes, well then, okay. And then there's different ones. We can big ones and small ones and fast ones and slow ones, and we can apply them to different problems and different sensors. Um, so that's the sort of meta answer to your question. In the meantime, we're not ready for that, although I make the argument for that in the book. Um, we have to come up with um, uh, you know, robotic or um, embodied um, um, benchmarks. And, um, and I know you know more better than I do that there's some really serious attempts in this area right now, and people are doing some really nice work in this. But those are still going to be sort of task oriented, you know, like, okay, we're going to have some model environment. And the goal is to be able to, you know, find the, the, the screwdriver and, and stick it in the, you know, in the, in the screw type of thing, you know. Um, uh, but, but I don't think that's what it's going to be ultimately. So with what we know uh, now about neuroscience, do you think that's enough to start building a true AGI based on these principles? And if yes, do you see a, a significant breakthrough in AI in this decade, decade in front of mentor or any other AI lab, or are we still decades away from that? Um, wow, there's, there's so much in there that's, and, and so much that's you know, uh, unknown. Um, let's just, let me take a couple of things here. First of all, we don't know enough right today to say, okay, here's, here's the, the, the schematic diagram, what we have to build, here's all the components, we know how to do it, everything, let's go do it. What, we, what we're proposing in the Manta and what I propose in this book is we have a whole new framework for thinking about this problem, a different way of thinking about what intelligence is. And, uh, and that framework is important. And some of the pieces of that framework we understand greatly and other pieces we don't, and we have to figure them out. But it's a framework and the framework then provides a roadmap of the things we don't know and the things we do know and what we have to do to get there. So could we start building a true AGI today? Like, like I can specify it and put hundred engineers on it and do it? No, not at all. Um, but it is, it is no, we're not just wandering around in the darkness and having no idea what to do. We can actually lay out what we need to do, even if we don't understand all of the components. Like we could say, well, we don't really understand all the issues about you know, how columns um, coordinate versus, with motor behavior. Well, we said we don't understand that yet, but it's a task and we can solve that task. Um, and I'm confident that the pieces that we don't understand are not decades away. They are in a sense years away or months away, uh, depending on the individual components. Uh, so what we've done at Nementa is we put this roadmap together, literally a roadmap of, of you know, different components that we can implement. Some we know how to do now, some we're figuring out how to do. And, and, and we think we can follow that roadmap to get to uh, AGI. Um, I don't, it, you know, in the way these things work historically, we can only look historically for precedent. You know, it, it, it's like an exponential curve. It's, um, you, it looks like you're not making a lot of progress early on, <laughs> you know, the incremental small things. Oh, we got our, you know, like we're doing the sparsity work now and we're showing these really great improvements in speed, um, you know, 50, 100x uh, performance improvements uh, on existing neural networks in speed, but they're not really any smarter. Right. So are those AGI? No, but that's one step along the way. And um, at some point, you know, the, you'll hit this inflection point and all things will take off. The same thing can sort of happen to the computers. If you go back and look at the history of computers, you know, people were fronting around in the er, late 30s and early 40s trying to build computers and they were all different types and they were kind of funky and didn't work, didn't work very well and there wasn't much agreement. And then at some point, you know, things started coalescing and then it, it, the computing industry took off quickly. Um, we're going to see that happen here too. Um, and I think one of the things that Momenta is trying to do is to sort of be a catalyst for that. We're trying to bring about like showing the framework, showing the, the path we have to take. Um, and we're going to do implement these pieces ourselves. If other people can do it, great. It, it, we're not going to wait around for other people to do it. So, you know, how long will this take? I, I can say confidently by the end of this century, you know, intelligent machines are just going to be, you know, as big as computers are uh, in the latter part, latter part of the 20th century. Um, is that going to take 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? I don't know. Um, it's hard to say. Where, where that inflection point occurs is, is a very difficult thing to predict. So, so you just mentioned now and before that there are still areas of the thousand brain theory that you're figuring it out. So what are those areas and what are we working on now? And how do you think machine learning research can help uh, can help you uh, figure out those? Well, um, yeah. 
first of all, uh, you know, we're doing this, we're living this right now in the Manta. So, you know, we're doing machine learning, we're implementing machine learning techniques based on the brain and we're using the brain to inspire them, but we're also learning from the machine learning techniques, what's working, what doesn't work. So that sort of interaction is happening right now. Um, there are, I think there's a quite, a quite a few elements of the theory we don't understand. Um, I can tell you what I'm working on and I think I've made some progress on. I'm working on the whole um, uh, motor uh, modeling going from a, a motor behavior to modeling uh, reference frames. How, do, how does the brain learn these reference frames based on motor behavior? And I could talk about that, but I'm, I'm, I'm doing that, approaching that from a neuroscience point of view. Um, we are also still, um, uh, uh, myself and Marcus and others are, are working on the, the issues of exactly how the reference frames are implemented. Uh, grid cells are not really just like a you know a Cartesian coordinate. They're complicated. They have other weird things going on that we don't understand. Um, and so there's a lot to be done there, understanding exactly how the reference frames um, are done. Another thing that's it's and I've talked about this in the book is we don't really learn where some sort of feature, if I'm learning a coffee cup or a new object, I don't really learn where some feature is in relative to a reference frame. What we think is going on is you're learning where objects are relative to other objects. And so, um, and so the whole thing is built on a sort of um, uh, compositional structure of reference frames relative to reference frames. And um, we don't understand all the details of that yet either. So these are some of the big things we're working on. Uh, but as I want to point out, we don't have to wait around for that. We're already doing um, the sparse work. We're doing now work on integrating uh, dendrites, which we didn't talk about at all, but dendrite processing in neurons, which we think will allow us to do uh, continuous learning, uh, which is another big problem of existing networks today. Um, and we are just starting to think about um, how to implement reference frames as part of this as well. Um, if, and Subutai, if I missed anything you want to talk about, go ahead and pipe up. But but you know we're we're going down this path. We're not waiting around. Um, how quickly it'll press us? I don't know. Yeah, that's uh, that's fascinating. There's <laughs> some sort of other sort of big issues we've talked about in past research meetings, but we haven't really ta tackled them. Maybe you mentioned this a little bit, but how do we generate behavior? Um, you know, we've talked a lot about how we, you know, how we might take behavior as an input or motor commands as an input, but what's the best way to generate behavior? That's something we've discussed, but haven't really figured out, you know, some of the details, yeah. um, you know, some of the issues of transfer learning, how you transfer knowledge, uh, when you've, you know, when you've learned about, when you build a model of some stuff, how do you really transfer it to something that's analogous, but not identical, uh, issues yeah. like that. We've, I yeah, was thinking about sort of that. I didn't, I didn't want to bring that one up because that's a complex, <laughs> that's a complex topic. Um, I can, yeah. Yeah. I can, I can elaborate on that one a little bit because it's particularly interesting to me. Um, it's, it's sort of like transfer learning, right? I mean, I can, I can learn the coffee cup by touching it with my index finger and then I can infer it by touching it with my, my ring finger. Well, the columns that are getting input from my ring finger didn't, you know, they weren't part of that learning. So I can't rely on those columns, but maybe I can. And so, so how does that, how do we transfer, how do we, you know, uh, transfer that knowledge from one part of the, you know, we, we sort of have an internal representation that can be applied to any sensory input. You know, I, I can learn what an object looks like and then I can touch it and recognize it, you know. Um, that's a fascinating problem. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm excited with or no, discovering out this. And I have one final question before we move on to the questions from the audience directly. And I think that's a personal question for you. So given what you just talked about, uh, that there is a long road ahead and there are things to figure out and we're not at the point we can just put 100 engineers into it. So for you, is it about the journey, figuring it out, or is it about the destination? You want to you want to get there. You want to see two AGI implemented. Uh, you're asking personally. It's a personal yes. question. Uh, well, I'm realistic about my age and my prospects for living for you know another 50 years. Um, uh, to me, my motivation uh, has always been. Um, excuse me one second. My wife is running around the kitchen here. Uh, my motivation is always, the thing that got me going in this whole field was not AGI. It was, I wanted to understand how my brain worked. I just felt like, oh my God, I'm this human. I'm on this planet. What a crazy world this is. We evolved to get this point. You know, we're a bunch of molecules running around and, and now I understand what's going on in the world. And, uh, 
but what the hell's going on in my head? How does this work? You know, who am I? I, I wanted to have just a general idea of what it means to have a brain. That was, it wasn't like I needed to know everything. I just think just when I got into this, it was like you couldn't, there's nothing to explain how your brain worked. And so I feel in some sense, I've achieved that goal. I have this, the framework of the thousand brain theory sort of like, okay, I have a pretty good idea what the basic thing that's going on in our head. Um, so that was personally, that was the motivation for me. I felt all along that the fastest way to AGI would be by studying the brain. That was a very speculative or certainly controversial position. Um, most people didn't believe that. Most people believed, uh, most AI researchers, we're going back now even to the 80s, right? Most AI researchers then, and even today, think you probably can ignore how the brain works. It doesn't really matter. We'll figure it out. We don't need to study the brain to do that. We'll figure out how to do this because we're good, smart engineers and scientists. Um, I always felt that that was unlikely to be successful. I felt that the, the brain, we knew it was so much, so different than the way people were thinking about AI that we would probably not get there if we weren't studying the brain. And, but I couldn't prove that. And I didn't, I never tried to convince other people of it. I just said, we'll see, I'm gonna study the brain. You can go do your own thing. Um, and uh, so far my predictions have turned out true. You know, we're not really close to having AGI or true AI. Um, but we are getting close to understanding how the brain works. So, um, and we started having this roadmap how to get there. So uh, I think that's cool. Uh, I, of course, I'd love to see these things come about, but I'm also realistic that, you know, in my lifetime, I will not see, you know, the ultimate impacts of, of, of true AI um, because it's going to be playing out for you know, many, many decades into the future. Um, and that's some reason that one of the reasons I wrote the last part of the book, and maybe I should talk about that. But the second part of the book is all about AI, but the last part of the book is about humanity. And, and I said to myself, well, what are the implications of having intelligent machines? Truly intelligent machines are smarter than we are, that are, can have different embodiments, uh, that you know, have different uh, parameters and attributes associated with them. Uh, if we think going forward into the, into the, not even the distant future, but just even a few hundred years, um, you know, our world's going to be really different in a few hundred years, uh, even in a hundred years. It's even at the end of the century, it's going to be really different with all these intelligent machines. And well, how should we think about ourselves as humans? And how should we think about humanity um, in that world, in that world where we're not the smartest people around? Um, and, um, you know, and that's what the third part of the book is about. So that was my attempt of saying, well, I'm not going to be here for that, but I'll, I'll at least take a, a, take a stab at what I think it's going to be like. <laughs> <laughs> great. Yeah, that's a great answer. Uh, yeah, thank you a lot, Jeff. Uh, that was a lot of fun for me. I hope it was a fun for those listening. Uh, I'll hand over to Charmaine, uh, who's going to DJ and handle the questions from the audience. And yeah, thanks a lot. Oh, sure. Well, and, and as we get these questions, I've Lucas and Subutai, feel free to jump in and answer them too. Yeah, sure. I'm sure that some of them I won't be able to answer. <laughs> Well, cool. thank you, Lucas and Jeff and Subatai. So um, we've collected a lot of really great questions on Slido and I've invited a few audience members to actually ask their questions in person. Um, so yeah, let's start with a question from Arthur. Let me give you permission to talk. There we go. Charmaine, uh, do you think we can uh, add video as well? I don't know if they want, I don't know if they want the video being recorded. They, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. So in, in case he wants, I think if you, you can maybe promote your co-host and then share a video or if there another well, way. I think in case, you, we're, we're recording this. And so I think you have to be a little bit sensitive about people knowing that. Yeah. Yeah. Right, um, yeah. So Arthur, I already permitted you to talk. I think you have to unmute yourself to ask the question. Okay. I was Perfect. having a conversation with a octopus and he pointed out to, or she pointed out to me that not all creatures think the same. I thought about it for a while and said, gee, that's very, very, very interesting. I'm descended from a squiggly little proto-chimp and she's descended from a clam or a proto-clam. Um, is anyone that you know of looking at these um, squid-based, squid-related, octopus-related, clam-related uh, neural systems? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Okay, so uh, we'll get to the octopus in a second. <clears throat> uh, octopus don't have a don't have a neocortex. Um, they're not colored really close. Let's first talk. But they about are very smart. Yeah, well, let's talk about birds. Birds are smart too, and they don't have a proper neocortex. Now, 
as we got into understanding the thousand brains theory and understanding the, the role of reference frames in movement, it became clear that this is not just a way of understanding the world. It is probably the way of understanding the world. Um, that it, it, it's hard to imagine, maybe it's a failure of imagination, but it's hard to imagine you can understand the world without having a model of the world. And it's hard to have, imagine having a model of the world if you don't move and build a model of the world in some reference frame. And so what's interesting, if you look at birds, they don't have a neocortex, but they have these two areas. I don't remember the correct name for them, but they're called blobs. They're, they have some, the such and such blob and another blob. And it turns out that they are looking, there's more and more evidence that those two blobs are in some sense in doing the same function using the same type of reference frame calculation as mammals do. That is, uh, th that mechanism, whether, whether we, we have a common evolutionary origin for it, or it was separately evolutionary derived, but it's looking more and more like birds have an equivalent to a neocortex, but it's not structured like a neocortex. It's structured in two blobs as opposed to a layer of neural tissue. But this, you see the same types of cells and the same types of interactions with them um, and so I would imagine that birds actually do perceive the world in some ways like we do. Um, the octopus, I think there was some evidence of the same thing for the octopus, but I can't remember it now. So I, I have to be careful about that. Uh, I know this evidence exists for birds and I think it also exists for octopus, but an octopus clearly can move its limbs to, you know, we've seen the pictures of them opening jars and, and solving problems. They have a model of the world and they have, you know, reference frames going on in that head. So I actually think they, we do understand the world in a, in a, in a similar way. There's a famous paper, it was called, um, uh, something about, it was about bats. It was called like, um, I don't remember the name of it, you know, what's it like to be a bat or something like this. <laughs> you know? And it, it, people were arguing that, that, you know, bats must perceive the world completely different than we do because they use echolocation. Uh, but there's another argument that says, no, they don't. Um, it, it, here's a, here's an, an, exam, an analogy. I can learn the world, my world through touch, right? If I was blind, um, I could, I'm, and there are blind people and they learn a model of the world. It's very much like you're my the people who are sighted learn the model of the world. Um, and I have both of those senses. I have the touch sense and a vision sense. I can, I can not touch things and look and I can touch and look and not touch things. And yet I build a very similar model of the world. Yes, they're different attributes. If I'm blind, I don't see the colors. I can't see a distance but I still model, have a similar model to the world. Helen Keller, who is deaf and blind, had a, she could converse and understood the world just like you and I did. So a, a bat or an octopus or bird has different senses, but in the end, they're gonna build a model of the world and they live in the same world we do, and it's at least the extent that the part of the world they live in is the same as we do. I think they actually would, they would think like we do. They would perceive the world, just like I can perceive the world to touch or sight. Um, you know, an octopus can perceive the world through tentacles you know, <laughs> or whatever they use. <laughs> so it's an interesting question. Uh, and of course, very, the answers are very speculative, but I, I actually do believe that um, in the end, we'll find that all these animals that do intelligent things are, have a similar mechanism. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so the next person would be uh, Matthew Lockbiller. Let me allow you to talk. Yes, Matthew, so I've given you permission to talk. Perfect. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Great. Um, so yeah, in the book, um, the concepts, well, at least the way the concepts were explained, um, I at least found them quite accessible. Um, but then when you sit down to write an implementation of it, you realize it gets complex really, really quickly. And so my question was, is there any way to experiment with the TBT theories to get a deeper understanding of the mechanisms or is there any opportunity to help build such a framework if it doesn't exist? I know there already is NUPIC, um, but, um, and, I, and I don't know if that's, if, well, I'll let you answer. I'll, I'll let, I'll let Subutai and Lucas answer that. <laughs> One of you two. <laughs> Uh, Matthew, when you said experiment with it, did you mean uh, running neuroscience experiments to test different parts of the theory? Because there's a lot of stuff that could be done there. Or do you mean sort of from a coding and implementation standpoint, do we have software frameworks or, or things like that uh, to experiment with? I suppose it would be more the latter. Um, I'm thinking about using these concepts in sort of simulations and real and sort of real-ish kind of scenarios um, in order to understand how they would work in a real system. 
Well, yeah, so um, we have, you know, for uh, the papers where we did simulations, we have kind of neuroscience based models that implement things like voting. So there's an exact, you know, proposed implementation of how voting works, how uh, we build uh, stable concepts through movement and so on. Uh, so you could definitely take that code base as a thing and try to expand it and work with it and try to see if there's different ways to, you know, expand the theory in different ways and, and try to do add goal oriented behavior or some of these other things we've talked about. We could definitely try doing that. However, th that stuff was not designed to be practically useful. It, you know, you, I, I think it's going to be very hard to take real world input and try to uh, get real systems working. It was more, these are models of the neuroscience. And so, um, you know, if you want to expand on the neuroscience theories, I think you could probably use that code base. On the practical side, that's a good chunk of our research agenda right now is, as uh, Jeff, you know, alluded to earlier, is taking different aspects of thousand brains theory, incorporating them into practical systems, and then sort of showing how uh, we can, you know, get properties that are difficult to get uh, otherwise. And so for that, you can go to nupic.research and follow along. You can look at our research uh, you know, we post a lot of our research videos uh, online and you can uh, follow along on that. But, you know, we, we have a long way to go ourselves on, on actually but, implementing but Subutai, all, the, all the current work we're doing, for example, as far as the dendrites, we're not, we haven't made that available yet, right? Is that? Uh, th those are available in nupic.research. So they're available in open source. So Is that right? A lot of the, um, you know, some of the stuff we've done with partners is not available, but the core uh -huh. ideas of, that were in house of dense in the House of Dense paper yeah. of how, do you, how you might you create uh, deep learning systems that are extremely sparse that show properties of robustness and try to get uh, you know, models that are as, as sparse as possible. We have code for that. We have uh, our code for incorporating dendrites and working continual learning is very much in progress. But as, you know, as with a lot of our other stuff, the day-to-day -day commits of that are openly available. So you can kind of follow along on that side. I mean, that's really cool that we're doing that. But you know, Matthew, I think maybe you were asking for something slightly different. You, you know, uh, sort of a, a, a platform for learning and experimenting uh, with the ideas. Um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you know, because like the code that Tsubita was just describing, this this code we're doing right now on uh, sparsity and dendrite learning, that's really deep technical stuff that we're trying to be practical with. You know. It's not, a, I wouldn't call it a platform for experimenting. <laughs> it's like it takes a team of, you know, dedicated uh, machine learning people to, to do it. Um, you know, but it's an interesting idea that, that you know, um, sort of a, some sort of intermediate um, uh, modeling that would illustrate the properties and let people experiment with it that maybe not yet, not yet like, you know, uh, world-class machine learning, you know, uh, benchmark performing, level but would be more of um, um, illustrating the principles and allow people to um, um, uh, to explore those principles in different ways of implementing it would be a very kind of really cool thing to create. Uh, I don't think the Menta is going to do that um, but you know that would be an opportunity for someone else I suppose um, you know sort of the, 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 the playground for, for a thousand brain theory you know. Yeah 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 that's really the, uh, the idea. Yeah, I think that'd be really, really cool to do. I just, it's not on our agenda. Um, <laughs> so, go for it. <laughs> for, for, for HDM, we have a, a community-based uh, community uh, repository uh, of Nupik, which I think it's great. And it would be great to see in the near future, uh, same thing for the Thousand Brains Tree, like community, uh, yeah. community base repository for the Thousand Brains Tree where everyone can- Yeah, someone picks connect. some sort of language to build it in and uh, build models and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. That'd be cool. Even sort of embodied environments and, and look, as you worked on this a little bit, but even sort of embodied environments where, uh, you know, you can really, uh, you know, test out different ways of implementing uh, the theory. And, those would be pretty cool. Yeah. Great, thank you, Matthew. Okay, so um, the next person will be Joe Perez. Give permission to talk. There we go. Hello, am I? Yep. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Oh, this is great. Uh, first of all, my my compliments to Jeff and to Numenta, Suputai, and everybody involved uh, for the for the great paradigm shifts that you have uh, created over the years. And I've been following closely, as you know. Um, I was very excited to read this book and I find it fascinating. Um, 
I would like to phrase one question only because um, I have many actually, but <laughs> it's a complicated question. I hope I can express it properly. Um, uh, in in my understanding, uh, as you just uh, as you just um, recapped uh, during this session, uh, we have approximately one hundred and fifty thousand cortical columns in the in the neocortex, and. Uh, whenever we have a, a learning phase where we, uh, for example, learn about a new object like a cup. Uh, so we build an allocentric uh, model of that cup by maybe movement and touch. Um, a certain subset of, uh, let's say, 1,500 of those uh, column, cortical columns will be active during that learning phase. And, we, and each one of them builds an individual model. Uh, they have a slightly different inputs because they probably have different uh, sensory um, uh, origins. Um, that subset of like of approximately, let's say 1,500 or so uh, models uh, is obviously stored in each cortical column, as you mentioned in the book, can probably store uh, hundreds um, uh, of, of different models from different uh, objects. So at some very different point in time, um, we have to. We will be able, able to recognize that same cup if we touch it. Now, my question is, that subset, uh, the same subset, has to be active in every one of those 1,500 cortical columns. Otherwise, they would be looking, uh, or, or maybe I missed something in my understanding. But uh, in my opinion, um, out of the out of the over 100 models that each one of them has, they have to all turn to the same page. Basically, it's the same map. Because they want to, they're trying to identify or disambiguate which part of the cup uh, they're actually touching. But first, they have to select that subset. Um, otherwise, they would be searching in a huge search space. Uh, my question is: Do you have any explanations or ideas? I, I understand that you're doing work right now with uh, the connection between. Uh, the motor, the motor sensory process, and the learning. Maybe that's the, re uh, or maybe uh, is the thalamus perhaps involved in some, in some type of episodic memory um, uh, so, creation during the learning so, process. So let me make sure I understand your question. The question is: Are you asking if I look at an individual column, um, it's going to be sensing some small part of something, and um, how does it know? Are you asking how does it know that that's a part of a cup? Because it could be part of lots of things. Uh, uh, okay, no, my understanding is okay. Um, the, uh, the, this this subset of columns that is active for the cup, yeah, um, they each have a, a different model of the entire cup. Yes. Well, and, in, 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 in and, the general and, idea, yes, they do. Yeah. Right. And 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 in the in the um, in the paradigm analogy that you explained in the in the first part of the book, um, uh, you were explaining how, for example, each one, for example, each finger, if it's one, uh, each finger in the, uh, that is touching the cup is trying to decide which part of the cup they're actually touching. They're trying to yeah. identify. So I'm envisioning all 1,500 or so active columns, all looking at the same map of the cup, but they're trying to, they're all not sure which part of the cup they're actually um, embracing. So the question, how do we infer a location uh, how's the common for a location? Uh, well, uh, my question is actually how is the the how is the subset of um, maps in each column interconnected to each other in such a way uh, during during the learning process uh, these maps have to be created first the, during the learning process the learning cycle at a later point in time there will be a sensory inference process and the same set has to be applied or uh, active the same set within a column uh, same set exactly right. the same set within each uh, column of, of the yeah this is, this is the complicated part of the yeah, explanation yeah, yeah. because uh, we have a we have a, a, a set of, uh, we have a set of over a hundred models in each column but we have a subset of um, um, of, of about a thousand five hundred or so uh, active um, for, for for any particular uh, object. Uh, okay, I think I just want to make sure can we, we can just focus ourselves on one column. How does one column do these things? Is that is that correct? Um, in, no, actually, my question. Uh, no, my question is actually the. Yeah, let me see my, if I can actual, uh, maybe Joe because uh, we have limited yeah. time. Let me see if I can rephrase sure. it some ways, and you can. Uh, 
it's sort of, uh, you know, you have each cortical column is getting different sensory input, but they're sensing from the same object. They're getting sensory features and they, there's sort of coordination among columns to figure out what the object is. But then knowing what the object is should help each cortical column know where they are on that object, on that coffee cup. And how does that coordination among locations happen? Um, you know, that's, I think right. that's, is, is that right. sort of what you're, because uh, each, in our model, I think each cortical column has their own uh, maps. Uh, so right. how does right. coordination amongst locations and, and, and stuff happen across cortical columns? Exactly. Uh, you phrased it correctly. Uh, okay, so, like, thank you, so very you, much. Don't, you don't have a question how a single column can do this. No, um, no. Okay, got it. You know, um, I maybe the, uh, we'll try to leave it this because I don't want to spend too much time on this. Um, I, I made a brief mention of this in the book, and this is a, a, an idea first brought up by Marcus Lewis, um, is that the, um, there is a coordination between the columns. It appears to be, it's, uh, imagine I have five fingers touching the cup. Um, you could say, oh, those five fingers are completely independent. They don't know where each other is. And so each one on its own is, is there's no coordination between their locations. Um, they're trying to vote on the object, but they, they don't know where the other ones are. We don't believe that's actually the case. What we believe it's the case is that they do know their relative positions to each other. And, and I gave this example in the book when I was talking about five people landing in a town at once and, um, and, and trying to figure out where they are. If they look, just look at the features, it's like a bag of features problem. But if they know where their relative position to each other is, uh, they can very quickly infer what, what town they're in. Um, so we believe that there is this coordination that's going on uh, between columns where they know their relative positions to each other. We do not have a good model for how that's happening. Uh, there's some candidate um, projections in the cortex in the brain that might be playing a role in this, but we don't know yet how that's happening. Um, so it works on a single column basis. It works on a multi-column basis if you, but it has some limitations, but if you can, if we can get this sort of relative position, they can, they then, then, um, they don't, they don't really have to vote on their locations. They just have to know their relative positions and that itself is sufficient to resolve the ambiguities. Uh, so I think that's, I'll have to leave it at that perhaps because- um, Yes, yes, thank you very much. Um, if, I, if I may add a question, just a, 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 a very short question to that uh, about your, do you have, uh, the, when, you create, when you're uh, creating these cognitive models, um, do you have um, the possibility to then request uh, your researchers in wet labs that uh, to actually um, no, uh, to, to, search for to particular? We, we can't request it to do anything. It's their money, <laughs> their time. Um, but here's what we can do. There are researchers who are interested in our theories. Who, and first and foremost, they say, oh, I've got some data that already supports this or contradicts it. Um, so there's a lot of this unassimilated data that we can mine we can mine it on our own, we can mine it with their help. Um, also, there are exp ongoing experiments which just happen to be you know, supportive or not supportive. So we, I don't know if they're doing it based on our work because these experiments can take years to do. You know? yes, uh, yes. Um, so it's a combination of, hey, they're interested in helping us, B, they got some data they think that would be useful, um, or C, they may, they may plan some future experiments. Uh, so we have some people doing that too. Um, but it's a, it's a very complex, it's not so simple. Like here's a theory, please test it. That doesn't work. <laughs> no, no, I imagine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, yeah. Joe. Yeah. Uh, and the next question is an anonymous question. So the question is computationally hardware wise, what is the biggest hurdle to running the thousand brains theory systems as it is in the book? What hardware do you hope to see implemented? Oh gosh. Uh, Subhita and I just spoke at this neuromorphic computing hardware conference recently and we were invited to speak there all the time because um, this is a big question, right? You know, what is the, what is the physical substrate underlying all this stuff? Um, today, I'll, I'll give a simple answer then um, and someone else can chime in. Um, you know, today, the today's GPUs, for example, are not a really a well suited for doing the kind of sparse computations and the complex computations that we see in the thousand brains theory. So uh, what's, what's really working well for a deep learning network today is not really probably the right solution for um, the kind of things we're doing. We are spending a lot of time right now on existing FPGA architectures because they are better suited uh, for the kind of things we're building. Um, you can also do this on GPUs, but they're not ideal either. So 
Uh, and then I think, so those are the options today, really, like you've got GPUs, CPUs, and FPGAs. Um, but in the future, there's gonna be new architectures uh, or derivatives of those three. And although we're in a lot of discussions with people about that, it's not clear what the right, the ultimate answer is gonna be. You ask what are the bottlenecks, uh, maybe Suetai or Lucas could answer that question. <laughs> well, uh, you know, it's sort of, uh, for us, everything sort of relies on sparse structures, like you said. And so having really efficient uh, circuits that can handle uh, really unstructured sparse systems seems to be a real impediment right now. And, and what those circuits are, not always clear. Memory is always a bottleneck. Um, you know, when, when you're doing really sparse, sparse computations, you want to be able to take just the non-zero pieces of one thing and the non-zero pieces of the other thing and then bring them together. Um, and today's kind of dense matrix multiplication focused systems are just not oriented for that. And it turns out you actually need very, you know, specific types of memory channels and memory bandwidths to, to make that efficient. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, different challenges in that, but, uh, you know, sparse doing good unstructured sparse computations efficiently is definitely a very important, going to be an important piece of this. It reminds me of, again, I like to think of the history of computing. You know, in the beginning, it was you could ask the, John Van Neumann, what are the bottlenecks of building computers? Um, and his answer, he, I'm sure he'd give me an answer, but, but, but the, you know, ultimately the inventions such as um, disk storage and solid state memory, or just even the transistor, you know, which just level in the integrated circuit completely changed, blew everything out of the water. And these guys couldn't anticipate any of that. I mention this because I think we're going to see similar types of innovations occurring in this field that we can't anticipate yet. Um, I, I, just to pick one thing, I think we saw this company uh, meeting with a company called Rain. Is it Rain Neuromorphics or Rain? I forget. Um, and they have a completely new way of thinking about how to build neuromorphic computers. Is it the right way? I don't know. It's pretty cool. It's really smart. Um, but, you know, I think there's going to be innovations which um, we can't anticipate today. But in today's world, as Subutai pointed out, it's very difficult to do sparse computations, especially on GPUs. Um, and, um, and so uh, we're working with uh, more the FPGA and CPU side of things. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Steven. I think he has a question about SDRs and sparsity. Uh, hi, guys. Um, yeah, so I read uh, on intelligence, but and then when you mentioned uh, the paper on yeah sparse distribute representations, which was just a mind blowing paper for me. And I thought, oh my God, they've done it. They've figured out uh, how the brain represents information. And so I was just wondering how um, that relates to thousand brains and, and how SD, what, what role SDR plays with GRED cells and reference frames and if they still feature in that way. Uh, okay, the short answer is yes. <laughs> still there. Okay. Um, I, I didn't talk about sparsity at all in the book. Um, in case you were wondering about that, I just felt it wasn't necessary for the audience, intended audience in the book. Um, it was hard enough for many people to get through it anyway. Um, so, but it's underlying everything pretty much. I, I can't think of a single thing we're thinking about doing or doing that doesn't rely on sparsity in one way or the other. Uh, as I said earlier, it's not all the classic, you know, very highly sparse population codes. There are, if you think about grid cells, for example, grid cells are very complicated beasts and they rely on other things. They do rely on, um, on scalar activation. They also rely on, um, uh, on, on oscillations and and um, and, um, and and where cells are spiking in different points of the, the different phases of the theta cycle, so there there are other things that are going on <laughs> that are that are much more complicated. But uh, so it's not all everything is just a bunch of SDRs. Um, but the SDR is still the the primary uh, underlying data structure. I, we still believe that yeah. for everything, pretty much. <laughs> There's other things going on too, but. And even, you know, early in this session, we talked about voting and a lot of the mechanisms of voting of representing uncertainty through union. So that kind of relies on sparsity and exactly how the voting mechanisms work. All of that uh, relies on, on sparsity. Yeah. But if you look at grid cells per se, they're not as sparse as we talk about in SDRs. Um, grid cells themselves are, are still sparse, but they're not as sparse. And they are uh, they are modulated by frequency uh, phase and by um, frequency of uh, firing. 
So there are different parts of the theory that aren't purely, purely is these very, very sparse SDRs. But they're still sparse. Grid cells are still sparse. <laughs> they're just not as sparse. <laughs> cool. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Um, yeah, and the next question comes from Jose. Oh, actually, never mind. Oh, sorry about that. Wrong person. Let me give you permission to talk. There you go. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, it's an honor to meet you all. And thank you so much for organizing this event. Uh, so uh, while reading the book, you mentioned briefly about how the TBT could extend to higher level of cognition, such as uh, language. So I was wondering if you could elaborate on how language comprehension and language production could equate to movement as implied by the TBT and how these ideas might extend to, to current state of the art in, in natural language processing. Okay, I was, I was with you to the very last part of your question because, uh, so we'll get there. Um, first of all, th this issue of the common cortical algorithm that the same algorithm is applying everywhere, including the language areas of the brain, it's just an empirical observation um, and we, we accept it. It's like, okay, the neural circuitry looks almost the same everywhere. And that was the Mountcastle's theory. So, um, and honestly, when you first start thinking about it, it's really hard to imagine, well, what is the thousand brains? How do these modeling, these sensory motor modeling systems, how do they model concepts and language and things like that? So as you know, there's an entire chapter in the book about this. And um, I did the best job I could to, to explain this. Um, and, and talk, it's take, stepping back from language, I talked about mathematics and politics and how you can think about conceptual knowledge in a, in a framework and a reference frame and how the equivalent for what a, a motor behavior, a movement behavior is, it doesn't have to be a physical movement, but it's still moving from location to location in a reference frame and the same process properties of metric spaces apply. So there's a whole chapter on that, I'm not gonna review that. I think the question of language is particularly tricky and, um, and I said that in the book. Um, and so I could only address one small part of language uh, at the time I was writing this. And that was the, the, the idea of, of um, a recursive structure, um, which is a very a key component of language. Um, and uh, linguists will talk about that. And so the thousand brain theory does explain, at least it gives a framework for understanding how neurons create recursive structure um, in, in the world. But then you said, well, how can we apply this and improve the current state-of-the-art you know, uh, language things? Well, we are currently working on language models and using sparsity and some of the other principles to improve those existing language models. But we're not anywhere close to building machines that understand language the way humans do. Uh, I think we have a lot to go there yet. We don't understand that yet. Um, and so I think in the short term, can we improve you know, GPT-3 and, you know, different language models. Well, we're doing that. We're showing you we can do that already, but going to the whole thousand brains theory aspect and showing how you can make a machine that really truly understands language. We're just not there yet. We have, we have a ways to go. Um, so I wish I had a better answer. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, yeah, so we have the last question and it's from Matthew. Let me give him permission and we can wrap it up afterwards. Hello, do you hear me well? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for your book and your inspiring ideas. Uh, I have one general question about how up to date are your ideas in your new book? And by this, I, I mean that I understand that there is a very long process between the writing of the last page <laughs> and the publication of the book, uh, maybe uh, up to uh, one year, I guess. Yeah. So, uh, are there any recent ideas or corrections that you wish to, to have included in your new book? Yeah. Okay. So uh, that's a good, I'll answer that question, but it's also good tying back to something Subutai said earlier. Um, we, we publish our research meetings. They're not pretty, um, but if you really want to see them, you can see us scratching our heads and banging our heads against the wall trying to work on problems um, in an unfinished form. Um, and so what I'm about to tell you has been talked about in our research meetings, but it certainly didn't make it into the book. For my personal side, what I've been working on is understanding how reference frame transformations occur in the cortex using the thalamus 
I've also been working on, uh, I think I have a really clear idea what's going on there. And I also have a very clear idea how many columns in the cortex represent dimensions in space. Um, we didn't talk about many columns, but they're a feature of the brain, feature of the neocortex. And so I'm really excited about that stuff. Um, it hasn't been published in any form and it's not in the book, um, but we've been talking about it and it's gonna get, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna write a paper about it. That's what I've been working on. Um, other things we've done is we've done a lot of work, as we always said, in the machine learning side of the, of the world in terms of improving performance on neural networks and implementing you know, sparsity and other aspects of it. And that's not in the book. I could have talked about that. Um, so uh, those are, I think, and then uh, I think in the Subutai or Lucas wanted to say something else that I forgot. All right, I'm not saying anything. So I think, <laughs> should I, yeah? yeah. No, no, I mean, there's a, there's a long list of stuff that we're working on in, the, in terms of incorporating machine learning. What, what, one of the things that comes up uh, in some of our recent work that we, um, is sort of exactly what the learning rules should be and what the, uh, how learning should happen, particularly when we're doing continual learning. We talked, to, we've done that a little bit of that in the HTM world, but, uh, you know, how unsupervised or self-supervised learning should happen in a way so you can create powerful representations uh, in a way that's continually learning and all of that. That's a really interesting kind of area that we haven't really talked about much before and, and we hope to do uh, more up uh, down yeah. the road as well. So you I'm might not sure, I'm not sure I would have included team. that in the book or not, but um, that's probably too deep, yeah. but it's, it's definitely yeah, yeah. working on. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's, since it's the last question, it's a good thing to point out that this is an ongoing concern. Uh, we're trying to be very open about everything we're doing. We're we'll trying to be honest about what we don't understand. Um, and you point out the book is a point in time. It is over, you know, I stopped writing it a year ago, over, you know, over, a little bit over a year ago. Um, so um, we're, uh, and we're, you know, we're just doing our best to try to uh, progress the field. So uh, I, I will just say myself, I want to thank everyone who participated in this and everyone who's here. Uh, I know a lot of people are listening. Um, so we really appreciate that. And Lucas, thank you for organizing this. Uh, maybe we need a third book in a few years. <laughs> you can write that one, because <laughs> how about that? <laughs> I guess you're being Portuguese. That's what I think. <laughs> Thanks for your answers. Yeah, by the way, I love your book, Matthew. It's really great. Yeah, Matthew, oh, maybe you should write the third book. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, keep in touch. Yeah. Yep. Keep. Thank you. Oh, all right. We're going to wrap up. Uh, yes. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks, Jermaine. Do we have more questions? Can we? Uh, do we have time for more questions? I think, or I think we should wrap up. I think we should wrap up. We should okay. Wrap up. Okay. Uh, so we still have we still have a lot of questions. Those are really good questions, and, and both in Slido and Zoom Q A, in chat, in HTM forums. So what we can do, what we do in every brains at pay session, is that we collect all those questions in a Word document, and we provide the link to both the attendees and the panelists and the panelists can answer their question directly in the Word document later. So would you be willing to do that as well, Jeff? Uh, uh, it depends we... on how much time I have. Uh, uh, yeah, no, yeah. Uh, Not just you, but maybe <laughs> Subutai can help as well. Yeah, yeah and something Charmaine's been actually been doing recently is, is doing our research meetings at the beginning. Sometimes she will ask some of the questions from the community. Maybe we can just answer the, a few of them live. Uh, we yeah. can pick a few of them uh, and yeah. then answer them live in our yeah. research meetings. And, that would be pretty cool. I, I saw I saw someone ask, are we going to make the recording public, Charmaine? Do we, do we have plans? Yes, yet? and for anyone who's wondering, I just added our YouTube link on the Zoom chat. So you can just click onto that Nementa link, and then you'll see our Brains at Bay probably recording come out tomorrow or by Friday, the latest. OK. All right, well, great. Well, thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lucas. Thank you, thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Thanks, Charmaine. That was Thanks really everyone great. for thank coming. Thank you, Lucas thank and you. Charmaine, for organizing all this. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Dad, and this. Yeah, see ya.